So let's do a little introduction. This is me. Then we'll have Nicoletta speaking to us about the insights of the sibling survey. We'll have Peter and Hazel presenting us the learnings from the Duchenne Siblings Network. And then we'll have the recording of Dr. Federica Moriconi, who could not join, join us today. She recorded her session and she will give us her perspective on Duchenne siblings. Then for the last 10 minutes, we will do a Q&A and discussion session. And then this about wraps it up. So let's start with our first speaker, Nicoletta. Thank you, Katerina. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today uh, speaking about this important topic uh, that is more than a topic. It is based on uh, an important relation in someone's life, you know, because having a brother or a sister is a really powerful experience in life. So, um, but uh, in the DMD families and also in other families where there is someone with a, with a disease um, could be really a, a complex experience in some cases. So this is some, an area that we wanna explore and uh, uh, before exploring it and uh, trying to understand the needs uh, and uh, you know what is needed in terms of information, involvement, uh, education, um, we started asking uh, to our groups uh, uh, some questions about uh, the world of siblings. Next slide, Katerina, please. So we started with one really simple question. We had around 15 participating until now to this survey, providing information about siblings and DMD. So we asked if, um, you know, do you receive many questions about this topic from your families? So we were speaking with the groups. And we had two different situations. One, uh, you know, that you can see in one uh, reply, this is really uh, an important topic, more attention is needed. So uh, maybe our groups notice that we really need more information, more engagement, more actions um, about siblings. And another important area is most questions are about screening younger brothers or conceiving new children. So beside, you know, one psychosocial uh, aspect and one psychosocial overview on siblings and DMT, we also have this important area. So um, siblings and care, siblings and testing. This is really an important area that we will develop with new information and materials. Next slide, please, uh, Katerina. Thank you. Uh, then we asked, uh, do you have a specific program on siblings in your country? And the replies are two. So in some areas, for example, um, some, uh, you know, areas with social and economical problems, we got this kind of reply. In my country with the poor conditions, we don't have many programs for the patients and the families, but we hope in the future, there will be more programs to improve patients' life and families as well. So we noticed that where um, the organizations are to create, have to create uh, new programs, uh, new basic programs to raise awareness of the disease, to involve the families, to involve the clinicians, to start, you know, the, the important actions that are related to a patient organizations. Of course, having a program or program on siblings um, is still not in the strategic plan because they first have to be focused on other topics. But this is an, an area of interest. So this is an important information that we got. Um, on another side, and we will know more uh, about this network in a while, um, we have a really powerful experience in, uh, in UK. So um, the reply is we have the Duchenne Siblings Network, which hosts um, just under 50 siblings from around the world in our private Facebook group. We host regular siblings meetups online and have a video series siblings the spotlight. So this is a really powerful experience that we have in the UK and we have fantastic speakers speaking about it in a while. Next slide, please. Thank you. And we also asked um, 
if our groups organize events or breakout sessions on siblings. So we have some groups organizing conferences and also online events, and they have a specific session on it. So we got, we have organized a separate session for siblings during our Duchenne festival. So this is one of the case. Um, and another important experience uh, um, was related to one survey sent uh, from another group, and they said we recently conducted a survey on the readiness of for the transition to adulthood, and one of the most interesting and surprising results that emerged from the survey data analysis was the positive relationship between the number of siblings and the level of readiness. So um, the rule of siblings is really a powerful and important rule that has to be um, highlighted, has to be to, you know, uh, to receive more attention from the community, uh, information, and of course, as always, education, because in this way, we can make uh, a difference together. Uh, with this insight from our uh, global community. I give the opportunity to um, the fantastic speakers to present uh, the direct experience that they uh, live it. And uh, Skaterina is again your time. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. This was great insight. So we'll move on to Hazel Weaver and Peter Duffy. I will do a short introduction on them so that you know who they are. So Hazel is a Duchenne sibling and a co-founder of the Duchenne Siblings Network. Hazel has a black belt in judo, grade eight at flute, and currently works at a special education at Leeds School. Hazel is a wife and mother to her son, Connor, who is seven years old. Hazel will be talking to us more about the siblings' relationships and all the emotions that can be formed in this relationship. And then we'll move on to Peter Duffy in the, in the, in the discussion. And uh, Peter is a Duchenne sibling also and a co-founder of the Duchenne Siblings Network. He has worked for a variety of Duchenne charities in the UK, and he currently works in the grants team at BBC Children in Need. He also freelances as a communications and digital strategist. He enjoys, he enjoys learning languages, writing and playing piano. And Peter will talk to us more about the Duchenne Siblings Network, their actions and initiatives that they have in place. So. Hazel, whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Hazel. Um, it's really, really, it's an honour to be here today. So thank you for having me. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the findings we've found um, running this, this support group and, and what we've discovered as siblings talking to other siblings. Um, but I should say, this isn't a scientific study. This is just us talking to other people, other siblings each to each other and the similarities of behaviors that we've discovered. Um, and I think it's important. The first uh, thing we talk about is the sibling relationship. This relationship, like a lot of sibling relationships is very positive, but I feel if one of them has Duchenne, then it's particularly special because you know that there is something going on in one of the person's lives that's going to have a profound effect on them. Um, so both, both uh, siblings become very supportive and very helpful of one another. Um, everyone we've spoken to has a positive relationship with their sibling, which I think is really wonderful. And this has had a lasting effect on all of our siblings, regardless of what the, the, the Duchenne journey has, has done to them. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So we do have to talk about the negative emotions because of course that's, I think, why we're here is to have a better understanding of, of what goes on. And the biggest one we found is that siblings are very good at internalizing their emotions. And from a very young age, siblings may experience quite complex emotions. They might feel things like guilt and jealousy at the same time. Um, but they might not understand enough of how they're feeling to express that to anybody. They also will have low self-esteem because the one thing they don't want to do is they don't want to cause a fuss to anybody. The situation of Duchenne can be very difficult at times. So the last thing you want to do as a sibling is make that harder for the people around you. So a lot of the time you stay quiet and that I think contributes to that low self-esteem. Just like with parents, Siblings also feel feelings of loneliness and helplessness 
there's this very difficult situation going on at times and there's nothing you can do to help except be a shoulder to cry on and that that can have an effect on on our on our siblings as well and unfortunately nearly every sibling we've spoken to has said that they've had counseling and it hasn't been as successful as they would have liked or it hasn't been successful at all um which is quite sad i think so it shows that there really is an understanding of the sibling experience when growing up alongside Duchenne. Um, can I have the next slide, please? But it's not all bad. Actually, if you are a sibling with Duchenne, there's some really, really positive um, parts to being a sibling. You become very resilient and you become very hardworking because it's, it's that attitude again of, you don't want to let anyone down and you want to be the best person you can be for that situation you're in. So siblings are caring and loyal and reliable. Um, we often have a high level of emotional intelligence. And a lot of siblings mature very quickly. If you meet a young person, let's say in their teens, who is a sibling, you will find that they are very mature for their age. And that's that's a very common trait. And this also means because they're more mature, they're more independent. And siblings are overall really good contributors to society overall. They have good jobs, they raise families, and they have careers. So these are people who contribute to society, that contribute to life, and, and, and they do that very well. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So what can we do to help that's that's the big question isn't it um and it's quite simple we found that by providing an opportunity for siblings to share their experiences has been a big game changer for a lot of these siblings these are a collective of people who have successfully kept their emotions hidden or internalized for a very long time so by allowing a space that siblings and other siblings, it's been really successful. Um, but you do need to allow time for any sort of support network you put in place. You need to give it time to grow. It's not going to be an overnight success um, because these people are not used to sharing their feelings. They're not used to sharing their experiences. And a lot of people won't want to come across as ungrateful or unkind. So a lot of people will be very careful about what they share and who they share that with. But by, if you continue to engage with your siblings, like we do in our network, that seems to have a nice, we've had a nice flow of engagement build up over, over the, the, the few years we've been running it. And as you build that engagement, um, you also build trust with the siblings. And if you can gain a sibling's trust, like I said earlier, with those positive attributes like loyalty and caring, they will they will go all the way with you. They will they will give you their entire heart. Um, and I'll probably um, end my bit by just saying um, that if you decide to put a support group together um, or any sort of support network, please don't think that a low level engagement means that there's a lack of interest. That's not what it will mean at all. And um, what it will actually mean is there's low engagement because they won't be ready to share their story with you yet. And you have to allow siblings time to do that. Um, but if you can do that and you do give it time, it will build. But you have to trust the process effectively um, and give siblings time. Uh, and that's that's my, my part of the presentation. I think Peter has the next part of the presentation. Yes. Thank you very much, Hazel. This was really important. And then Peter, if you want to take the floor. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I thought I'd just put some pictures of me and my brother since Hazel did as uh, with with her and her brother. Uh, that's my Andrew, he, uh, my, my brother Andrew. He's 30 years old. I'm somewhere in my early 30s, so I'm slightly older brother. Um, and yeah, having worked in the Duchenne community for a long time, uh, since graduating university really uh, and well having been in it a lot of my life it had always been prompted to me like why don't you do things for siblings or you know you've got this unique experience but per perhaps um sorry i didn't check can everyone hear me okay it's 
is yeah i'm not on mute or anything yeah we can hear you very well you can hear you really well thank you i usually check like immediately and then i thought oh goodness i didn't um so yeah it had been said to me before uh, you know you know why don't you build on this perspective but i and i actually think that that's quite a sibling response or my response was a sibling response which is this idea that well it's not really about me like you know it's it's about our brothers and it's about um, you know, it, it, it's it's their show or th that 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 kind of thing. Um, so it wasn't until 2018. Uh, so so I'll, I'll just start by saying I'll you know I'll, I'll give you some perspective on how we sort of have have been building this network. Uh, just so that uh, you know, it may, may, maybe if, if you guys want to take anything from it or um, you know, yeah, it's, see see kind kind of see how we did things. Um, so 2018 was when we, me and Hazel and two other siblings had the opportunity to speak at an international Duchenne conference. And we came together and we just gave talks on our perspectives. And I think it was a very natural, uh, just a very standard, ordinary thing for us to have done. But what we found in that was something that um, was really quite unexpected. Uh, the four of us became really good friends and um, I, I think that was the first point where we thought, OK, there is some reasoning to this, to starting a, a group of siblings to try and, you know, kind of be there and have peer support in that way. So what we did just amongst ourselves, we started a group. Initially, it was just a WhatsApp group with the four of us. And then we put it on Facebook and had a Facebook group, just a closed private Facebook group with the four of us. It was a bit lonely, but it was all good. And uh, it, it was really just chatting, you know, once a week or so, just saying how, you know, how, how are you doing, checking in, that kind of thing. And it wasn't really Duchenne focused. Um, and, and, and that was, you know, it, it was really good. We found three new friends, each of us, and that was great. So we maintained contact, just the four of us, and we had an in-person meetup. We met up in Nottingham uh, in 2018 or maybe beginning of 2019. And, um, yeah, it, it was just, you know, we stayed the night somewhere and, and, and had, had a catch up and it was all great. And... From there, we thought, well, how can we do a little bit of outreach? So if, if we just move on to the next slide for that. Because the idea was, well, we've got the four of us and maybe we can get more people in and expand the group. Uh, maybe we can connect with other siblings and also maybe we can connect with parents and families um, because people would have questions, people had questions for us. And so that was a good way to kind of have that connectivity there. So for that, we set up this Facebook page, which would act as the external page. And then we could kind of go back and forth between the two. We have our internal group, uh, in the private group for chats, and then the external page to be able to talk about what we were doing and connect to more people. So I, th I think what we actually did was we put, up, uh, put out a post from Hazel uh, talking about her experience with her brother. And Hazel shared that in a lot of the groups, a lot of the international groups, and kind of said, hey, we've got this group here. If you want to join, you know, here, here it is. I also had, from my years working in the Duchenne community, maybe 10 or 15 or 20 friends who were siblings, sort of individually that, you know, just people I'd met along the way. And I messaged them and said, hey, do you want to come along? And from Hazel's post, in, in the groups, we also got um, you know, to kind, of, kind of that interaction of people coming in there as well. Um, we had a slight barrier on the group, which was just to make sure that everyone coming in was a Duchenne sibling, just asking a few questions. Um, and, and, and then that was all. So from there, that's how we had the group and that's how we got the group to a slightly um, more expansive uh, level. And that group exists really just for people to be able to put in questions whenever they want, uh, even if it's just, hey, I'm having a bad day or, hey, do you, you know, I've got, you know, do you have any advice about this kind of thing or that kind of thing? Um, 
And uh, yeah, I will go back to what Hazel says about low engagement doesn't mean lack of interest, because I think that is the thing with Duchenne siblings. Uh, many of us, we uh, like to know that there's something there for us, even if we aren't always uh, using it or aren't always going to be there because um and, and i think i mentioned it in in my considerations on the next bit so i'll just leave that for now and come back to it in a second um so the next step uh, was well what kind of outreach can we do to kind of help uh, you know to, sort of well, may, maybe educate people but also just uh, you know share our own stories and kind of get things out there and um, uh, respond to maybe questions people have so that's when we set up this sibling spotlight podcast uh, calling it spotlight because the, it, again what Hazel said you know you're so used to well the spotlight being somewhere else and in this dimension in this uh, element it's like okay the spotlight is on the sibling and, and oh, what's your life how's your life been what are your experiences experiences and, and sharing those lived experiences um, and yeah we film those I just edit them and and, and we put them out um, we've done uh, four so far and got a fifth one coming out in the next week and uh, yeah these are brilliant opportunities for us uh, like uh, to kind of chat with a sibling and for that sibling to then share their story and chat with us and then the the, the third benefit for and, and you know anyone watching uh, or, or joining in to then kind of you know see see that sibling's story and, and sharing that with them as well um, and and all, si all all our siblings uh, are, are, are welcome on uh, you know at any point when we get around to it and when when we get around to it in the future. So um, yeah, I think it's a really inclusive process and it's a really sort of good way of sharing our experiences with each other and with the wider community. We also have online Zoom meetups, um, and these are well it, it just essentially me and Hazel and a couple of other siblings and we just put this in the group maybe a week ahead of time or two weeks ahead of time uh, uh, sometimes we put it on the page as well just to kind, kind of to get a, a, a broader uh, audience for it but uh, usually it just goes in our group and we'll say hey this one evening uh, you know usually a later evening for UK time to be earlier evening uh, or later afternoon in in, in in other countries but notably uh, uh america um and uh, yeah again it's really just the chats catch up and then so yeah sometimes to relive kind of experiences memories growing up and that kind of thing but uh, really just a support system you know a support basis uh to be there as as, as, as friends and siblings um, and so that brings me on to in-person meetups and events. This is where I, I, I think, again, what Hazel said, it's a step-by-step -step process. And I think often you might want to start with an in-person event or that kind of thing. But if you build up to it slowly, then you can manage expectations and, um, you know, get there in, in perhaps in, in the best and most optimal way. So um, we had planned an in-person meetup kind of, kind of with, with a wider group of siblings, uh, kind of, well, maybe a year or two ago and weren't able to because of the events of COVID-19. And uh, this is something we're looking towards doing now in the autumn. We have one of our siblings uh, from the United States is going to be over in England in the October, and we're looking to put together uh, kind, kind of a, a day out or an evening out uh, just with other siblings in the UK or in any sibling who can be in the UK. And um, we're, we're, we, we've also been talking about doing something with um, one of our charities here in the UK, who's very good at uh, those kind of events and days out. And, uh, you know, so, so it's also a consideration that maybe we'll do a siblings day just for siblings or a siblings evening, or maybe we'll make it a wider thing where we'll have families coming along and, and families can bring younger siblings as well. And it can be more kind of, kind of uh, you know, that kind of get together. So that sort of stuff is still in the kind of process. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just thinking about what's best and, and what everyone wants. And we'll come to a conclusion on that soon. But that's 
the network at large. Um, and yeah, if we move on to the next slide and then I'll finish off with some considerations because it, yeah, I, 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 again, I go back to what um, Hazel said about, you know, it, th there will be times when you have a lot of engagement in any group and there'll be times when it's, you know, there's not as much engagement. So um, yeah, that's, that's the first point here. There's times when your group might not be super responsive. Um, so I, I would just say whether those storms, or, you know, well, not storms, but <laughs> just, just keep going. Um, because, uh, it, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's always an important thing with, with, with any group or uh, peer support network that you might have. Um, and manage your expectations as well uh, for that group on that basis. Um, Siblings have their own lives and commitments. Um, you know, a lot of the time here, we're talking about siblings who are well over the age of 18 and, you know, and, and, and fully, grown ad, fully grown adults. And um, so, you know, uh, some, some people, their Duchenne sibling the bit was, you know, a, a lot in their past. So, um, and, and, and they have families and everything else now. So um, there is that. Um, also, many siblings, and, and this is something that we've found, or it's, it's definitely something I'd say from my anecdotal experience. I, I feel a lot of uh, other siblings, and, and you know ourselves as well, have sort of mixed emotions about the journey. Um, you know, when you're talking about the idea of the, the notion of being a Duchenne sibling, it's it's a very sort of wide path. It's it's someone's entire life, um, for for the most part. Um, so there are bits that you know uh, are, are positives and bits that aren't quite so positive, um, just as Hazel was talking about earlier. So I think you also have to manage that carefully at times, um, and I, I guess you have to be quite understanding at, at times as well um, with what people want and what people might not want. Um, some people will want different things, different forms of engagements, and 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 all that kind of thing. Um, People, and again, sorry, I'm, I'm second guessing my next points here. Uh, people sometimes want different things at different times. And yeah, that, that, that is another thing. Um, we've had people come along to our Zoom meetups and sort of uh, it, then, then you know, other people talk about, well, I definitely go to an in-person meetup, but they might be a bit shy to come to a Zoom meetup or that kind of thing. Some people who really enjoy watching uh, the sibling spotlight podcasts we've done that wouldn't want to come on one themselves, uh, you know. So yeah, I, I think that's again always the case with with groups. I particularly find it the case to be with our Duchenne siblings uh, group again, just because the, the variety and diversity of people. Um, and again, just with all good groups and peer support networks, allow your plan to change and evolve based so, and, and evolve based on needs and expectations. So again, it's allowing it to be organic, allowing it to be what the members want it to be, and uh, yeah, allowing that process to unfold naturally. So yeah, I think that's that's all for the moment. And any questions, uh, feel free to drop in to Hazel and myself and everyone else. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Hazel. The insight and the initiatives are all great, and I think it's a source of inspiration for all of us. So let's move to the last presentation for the day. I will be changing my screen. So this is Dr. Federica Moriconi. She's uh, not able to attend today, so she sent to us her recording, and I will open it in, in a few seconds. So uh, to start, Federica Moriconi is a psychotherapist and consultant for the Simple Operating Unit of Clinical Psychology of the Agostino Gemelli University Hospital Foundation. She has studied the cognitive and behavioral mechanisms in the presence of developmental disorders and has devoted herself full time to research in child neuros neuropsychiatry, child neurosurgery, and at the Nemo Pediatric Clinical Center. Dr. Moriconi has actually allowed us to share her email if needed for any questions. So don't hesitate to ask us by email. You can contact me at Katerina at Dushanta Foundation and ask me to share her email with you if you want to ask any further questions. I will just share the presentation. Okay. 
Good afternoon, I'm Federica Moriconi, I'm a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist of Fundazione Policlinico Universitario Agustino Zionari in Rome. I would like to thank um, all people who gave me the opportunity to be here and to talk about uh, this specific topic. Today, I would, uh, would like to introduce uh, uh, my presentation about Duchenne siblings um, in a psychologist, uh, psychologist uh, perspective. The bond, uh, bond between siblings uh, is uh, one of the most important and significant relationship in life. It allows uh, to develop skills such as the ability to play and to communicate. It also promotes sharing, reciprocity and empathy behaviors. Uh, according to Ali, this uh, relationship overpass uh, all the stages uh, of the family life cycle. Siblings uh, are uh, witnesses uh, and uh, an active part uh, of uh, every family event. Um, in this uh, picture is uh, uh, reported uh, the uh, stages of the family life cycle, living home, marriage, uh, families with uh, young children, uh, families uh, with adolescents, uh, loving uh, children and families uh, in later life. According uh, to Salvador Minushin, the sibling subsystem is a social laboratory for children who may use this uh, social environment to safely experiment with peer relations exercise their right to privacy at their own interest and be free to make mistakes. Over time, the sense of attachment, friendship and proximity allows to develop their identity. The functions that each sibling performs in the family depends largely on the role he acquires and on the identity he has created in the context of family life. In all cultures, the family imprints its member with selfhood. Human experience of identity has two elements, a sense of belonging and a sense of being separate. The laboratory in which these ingredients are mixed and dispensed is the family, the matrix of identity. Bank and Ken affirm that a very important aspect in evaluation of quality of the relationship between siblings is the level of access. The emotional bond between siblings can be um, characterized by an eye access and low access. The high access, um, the belonging to the same gender and the proximity to age, determine um, access to common life events. In this case, the relationship is characterized by reciprocity, symmetry, and empathy, and by the sharing of emotional experiences that build an, an intimate and close bond based on a strong sense of loyalty. In uh, low access, uh, siblings that often uh, belong to different genders uh, or have uh, different ages on over age uh, eight uh, and 10 uh, years. Therefore, they act uh, as members of different generations, share little time uh, of personal history, have different experiences, uh, have lived uh, in different phases of parenting. They are often siblings uh, not uh, fully aware of the sense of com community and belonging that um, the fraternal relationship can provide. This does not uh, allow them to share fully family events. Parents largely influence the siblings' relationship. They have the possibility to influence the functional positions of the children. Horizontal siblings' relationships, regardless of gender and age, strongly depend on how much parents allow them to become really siblings without negatively triangulating them and without involving them in their couple dynamics or in a family mandate, which weaken the natural generational alliance between each other. It is possible that the disease, especially in particular moment in the family life cycle, acts as a dividing element between siblings, not allowing them to have an adequate emotional connection for different needs and wants. 
Each family unit, in the course of its evolution, faces events and tasks that often require reorganization. Families differentiate from each other in the ways in which they cope with these developmental paths. Resilience is the ability of people to deal with stressful or traumatic events and to reorganize their lives in a positive way in the face of difficulties, allowing them to adapt to adversity. It arises as the ability to self-repair after damage, to cope, resist, but also build and positively reorganize recognize one's life despite difficult situations. Being resilient does not only mean knowing how to oppose the pressures of the environment, but implies as a positive dynamic, an ability to move forward despite the crisis and allows the constructions, indeed the reconstructions of the life path. A diagnosis of the empty places, the family in a very complex state of mind. An emotional fracture waves uh, that invades uh, every space, uh, putting a strain on uh, everyone's resources. Following the diagnosis, uh, families uh, generally pass uh, from uh, a phase of shock to one uh, of disbelief and uh, pro problem processing uh, only later than uh, they be um, begin to build a, a real relationship uh, with the child. Therefore, before reaching the adaptation phase, the parents go through shock and often the establishment of a defensive reaction, such as repression, denial, and regression. A diagnosis of DMD represents a potentially maladaptive event for most families. Having a child or a sibling with this disease is one of the most complex experiences to deal with. The way in which the family deals with this event, which certainly causes stress, will greatly affect the future development of the child and the family itself. The family must be considered as the protagonist of an adaptation process, as well as the victim of a stressful situation. Therefore, this is fundamental in the therapeutic process. The diagnosis can use a severe trauma in parents and siblings linked to the discrepancy between the ideal child they build as an object of love while waiting and the imperfect child that reality presents them. In this picture is um, represent the impact of the childhood trauma. It uh, um, can be characterized by um, changes in connection, such as difficult problem solving and language delays, physical health, such as sleep disorder or eating disorder, um, the changes in emotion, such as um, limited coping skills or the increased sensitive to stress, uh, a change, um, changes in relationships uh, such as attach attachment problems, disorder, um, mental health, uh, such as depression, anxiety. Um, it can be characterized by changes in behavior such as aggression or the use of drug and alcohol and in brain development such as smaller brain size or changes in gene expression. According to the general system theory, the assessment of the state of health is contextualized within the condition of life. The disease destroys the balance also based on the representations created by the family system and the siblings. Siblings often risk being left without a voice, almost invisible to the disease they are expected of. Siblings can risk being left on the sideline as the parental couple is moved by a protective and conservative instinct towards the child who does not live with the disease, who often finds in self-managing pain, pain independently and not being able to share it with a wounded family system. In other cases, they may be over involved in caring for the affected siblings. In both cases, uh, dynamics can be triggered that is uh, necessary to explore, placing an emphasis on reactions, needs, and emotions. They are often influenced by certain factors such as age, severity of the pathology, parental reaction, and the birth of order, 
uh, and the bird order. Um, for example, sibling uh, born before uh, is correlated by protection dynamic, uh, and the sibling uh, born after is correlated by rivalry dynamic. Siblings are often the subject of a dynamic of protection, which translates uh, into a protective exclusion. For months or years, they are uh, children or teenagers who are not provided with the information of the disease in order to avoid pain. A pain that is uh, difficult to process and um, integrate with, within the family system. The healthy siblings experiences an existential fracture as there um, is a before and, uh, and after diagnosis. This may require an elaboration in several stages. The family system must necessarily adapt to the fracture activating or adapting the resources it processes or creating new ones. The siblings with the disease will feel remorse and in burdening the healthy brother, experience guilt or on the contrary, feel a victim of abandonment by the latter. And for this feel resentment and anger. The siblings who does not live with the pathology could live a life dominated by the limit of guilt and therefore deprive himself of experience or feel himself, himself the victim of um, an excessively heavy burden. A dynamic of conflict often arises between a healthy child and parents dictated by different wave, way of relating to the disease, which generates misunderstanding, quarrels, and tidy communication. The healthy child could uh, adhere to a protection circuit of the family system, perhaps becoming invisible to make room for the disease or the needs of the sick brother, adopting strategies of avoidance or denial of their own needs, or assume an aggressive attitude and at times provo provocative behaviors in order to regain possession of a space. In the care process, uh, it is important to include siblings, and listen to them and support them to express their own needs and feelings, which are often conflicting and uh, contra contradictory. In our uh, um, clinical practice, uh, we have uh, identified some prevailing needs, uh, such as give a name and a meaning to what happened. Uh, involvement in the care of the brother to feel useful and involved, recognize behavior to express and share their feelings, maintain a relationship of exchange and play between siblings, and being able to experience moments of fun and normality. In conclusion, it is, uh, it is uh, necessary to restore roles and functions uh, as well uh, as uh, redistribute the right uh, connected to them, to analyze the multiple uh, perspectives, uh, to offer a space for sharing and containment, for elaborating personal experience, reading one's own history in a relational key, attributing new meanings uh, that allows one to assume a different uh, perspective. It is in the entire family system that the resources are necessary to resume the evolutionary time of which are discovered or renewed. Um, I would like to say thank you for your attention. I write my email address for any questions. Thank you. And this was Dr. Federica Mariconi, her perspective on Lucian siblings. And this actually wraps up our presentations for today.